Stack Overflow. My name is John Rotenstein and I'm a developer advocate at AWS and I like to answer questions on Stack Overflow. So uh, I thought why not do it with some friends and that's you folks. Uh, join me as I go through uh, Stack Overflow, answering questions on AWS, play with lots of different AWS services and generally have a, a bit of a play and a bit of a chat about AWS. So uh, Hello Brad, it's good to have you back again. Have you in there? Take it you can see me, which is always handy. So uh, what you been up to Brad's since last week? Who else do we have out there? People tune in. Uh, this week uh, we'll be answering some Stack Overflow questions. I thought we'd also have a bit of a, a play with um, workspaces. Found some interesting stuff in workspaces. You can apparently use Linux workspaces. So uh, I thought it sounds a bit interesting. So we'll have a bit of a play with that. And I saw a few questions that might give rise to doing a bit of live coding. So uh, always fun answering a, a bit of live coding questions, mostly around how do I move files around S3 and, and some simple Python programs like that. Okay. So as always, um, I'll jump into Stack Overflow. So uh, always happy to get more people answering questions on Stack Overflow. And I'll uh, give a shout out to some of the people who are doing that uh, throughout the show as well. So for those who just joined in, hi, my name's John, and I'm going to answer some Stack Overflow questions and hopefully learn stuff about AWS. Um, I found that answering questions is the best way to learn something because somebody says, how do I do this? And I go, oh, that should be obvious. I try it myself and it is not obvious. So uh, I'll start by having a look at some recent questions that came up, but otherwise, uh, hey, thanks Rex Roof. Yeah, I used to go around to people and saying, I'm thinking of doing this weird stream. Instead of live coding, it's going to be live answering. And they all go, yeah. Give it a try. Um, I have also gone through questions earlier this morning and tagged, uh, bookmark some of the questions that are interesting. So uh, if I don't find any good ones here, um, I'll go back and do those ones. Now, as with everybody, uh, you can't know everything about AWS. So I always look at the uh, headings on these questions. For example, I'm not a Terraform person, so I can't answer Terraform questions. Um, this is an interesting one. In pipeline and in a node that I know nothing about let's have a look assume STS assume role did not exit successfully so it looks like they're calling assume role on a role so um, for those of you not familiar uh, AWS has IAM roles and these roles can give you permission to do things like maybe start and stop instances or delete things that a normal person wouldn't be able to do and you can assume a role to get temporary access to those extra permissions. And you do that using this assume role command that is part of STS, the um, security token service. And uh, one thing that's always worth knowing about uh, the security token service is that there's about four or five commands that it supports. And that's all it does. And the, what we're dealing with here is this thing called assume role. And assume role, uh, you use your normal credentials to say, I want to take on an IAM role. It then gives it back to you with new set of credentials and they work for a limited amount of time. And it's one hour, by default one hour, but the maximum is 12 hours. So uh, the, the permissions work for 12 hours after which you've got to reassume the role. And when you use an EC2 instance and you assign a role to an EC2 instance, let's give that a go. Um, it's the same thing. So if I hop into an EC2 instance, if I have permission to do so, come on, excellent. Um, so if I'm here in an EC2 instance and I want to say something like, hey, S3, list me my buckets, and it's come out here and uh, list me my buckets, it did that with a role that was assigned to the EC2 instance. The, a, the EC2 service assumed the role on my behalf, gave credentials down to the instance, and then I could make the call. So that's what uh, assume role always does. Uh, greetings for anyone who's joined in recently. My name's John. I'm going through answering Stack Overflow questions, but also using it as an excuse to talk about lots of things to do with AWS. So we're currently talking about the security token service. We all know this assume role. Assume role with SAML and uh, the web identity are great for um, logging in but using an external identity source so with um assume role with web identity you can use things like facebook or google and so you you authenticate through those services and then get uh 
uh, a role back to use with AWS. But there's a few lesser ones that people don't know about. Um, sometimes you try an AWS command and it comes back and says you're not authorized. And rather than telling you why you're not authorized, that in doing so, it might give you some clue as to the security setup. So um, I might say, um, your IP address is blocked. And if it came back and said your IP address is blocked, that's giving away some security information. So sometimes you'll see an encoded security message that comes back. And to decrypt it, you have to use this decode authorization message. And there's a, an AWS uh, CLI command you can use. Is there an example here? AWS CLI decode in authorization message. And it looks a bit like this. So you say AWS uh, STS decode authentication message, and then you give it the encrypted message and it comes back and decodes it and tells you why you might have failed. So that's a handy one there. Um, there's also get session token. Get session token is used to create a temporary session on your own credentials. Why might you do it? Um, this is one way of passing an MFA token. So if you have an MFA, multi-factor authentication code against your account, you can use get session token to uh, provide an MFA code and then it uh, gets running for a little bit. Argentina Contre, great to have you. Yep, feel free to send questions across. Can't guarantee I can answer them, but uh, you're always welcome to. Um, so anyway, lots of things you can do with assume role. So it looks like what they're doing is they're saying assume a deployment role. That's a great example. So they're trying to say, hey, um, permissions to deploy my code is in a certain role. You give it a name and command did not execute successfully and it can't find it. So now it's a, a node error. So I can't go further than that, but um, too bad. Is there another way of renewing keys on an instance rather than attaching a role to the EC2 instance? So uh, let's have a look. First of all, let's have a look in the EC2 console of what I have done. Now, not that long ago, uh, it was added the ability to change your um, role that's associated with the instance. So it used to be you could only attach a role when the instance was launched and you couldn't detach or change or do anything afterwards, but now you can change them on the fly. So here we can see I've got what I call my ops instance and I have an ops role associated with it. So if I log into this instance, uh, how do I know where I get my permissions? I can say ADF's IAM, I think get user will return. Uh, no, I'm not using a user. I have to say curl HTTP. Write a window, please. Uh, 169.254.169.254 latest. This is the instance metadata API. And I can say I would like some meta data security credentials and it comes back oh i have to say i am security credentials i do not know what i'm doing so i will just metadata i want i oh no there it is i am slash security credentials maybe i misspelled it before and it says i'm using something called the ops role so if I throw that to my end of my line, it comes back and says, here is my access key. Here is my secret key. Um, now, the fact that I've just shown it to you is not good. So what I should really do is disassociate that and reassociate that and it will come up with a brand new role for me. <laughs> Always be careful what you show online. So it goes through and it uses those credentials so that I can access my service. So uh, Contra asked, is there a way of renewing the keys on an instance rather than attaching the role? So the question is, does that rotate the credentials? So instead of using the IAM role associated to an instance, you could instead have your code call the assume role API call and specifically give it something. So let's say you have multiple bits of software, multiple apps running on that one instance, and each of them want to assume a different role, then they could separately call the assume role command to get it, but they would need their own credentials on which to call assume role, because I don't think you can call assume role on assume role. Um, can you use temporary credentials 
returns a set of temporary credentials. I don't think you can call assume role using temporary credentials. So you'd have to have a IAM user to call assume role on. So you, you can do that. Uh, let's look for another question here. Map non-cloud alternatives to cloud alternatives. Ah, um, here's an example of a question that is not um, typically accepted on Stack Overflow. Has anyone gotten past this issue when working with AWS? First of all, it's not a very good heading name. Um, so for those of you who just joined me, my name's John. I'm working through Stack Overflow questions. And one thing I'd like to do is point out good ways of using Stack Overflow. So this heading, think of Stack Overflow as a big um, encyclopedia of questions about programming and people who run into a particular problem want to go back and um, look up that information and uh, find an answer. This heading name uh, is not a very good name for somebody to find an answer. It doesn't state specifically what their problem is. Also, it's not specifically sort of about programming, so it was closed. So you might have your question closed if people um, don't think it's appropriate for the platform. Uh, there can still be a bit of discussion taking place on um, the chat here. And it looks like, ah, I see what's going on here. Uh, this particular person is saying they're getting a security token error message, which gives rise to two topics that we're talking about. Um, what are security tokens? In this case, the security token, I don't think is what they're expecting because it appears that they're calling a, um, let's back that up a bit. They're calling an API gateway endpoint which means it's somebody's application and whatever their application is doing is whatever you're meant to do. It's not an AWS service, but it does give rise to the concept of this thing called a security token. So let's have a bit of a play here. Um, I have, when you assume an IAM role, a very interesting thing happens and that's to do with the security token. So what I might do is go in here and create a new role and say it belongs to my particular account. And the name stack token, just for the sake of it. So I have a new role called stack token. And let's see if I can assume it. Uh, AWS STS assume role. Uh, say, oh, it wants, oh, let's go to the doc, CLI assume role. So we're on to role ARN. You get from my new created here and ARN stands for Amazon resource name and it's always in the format of ARN AWS uh, service name in this case it is IAM Move that up a bit um, then my account number and then a unique identifier for that resource so if you had the same role in a different account it would have a different ARN if you uh, were using a resource in a different service it would be different here and here's a bit of information for you this ARN AWS up the front. Uh, AWS is not always there. If you use the AWS China regions, for example, they have a different prefix in there. It is a separate AWS to the rest of AWS. So it's not always uh, AWS at the front there. Whoa, zoom. I copy that, put that in there, give it a role session name that just has to be any key to keep track of what's happening. And it's assumed a role. Now, the reason I created a new role is that new role has no permissions, so I don't mind if you see my secret keys here. But what does it give back? It gives an access key. Now, here's another interesting bit of information for you. You'll notice it starts with AS. Um, AWS has key prefixes. Yes. Thank you, Google. There's a wonderful page here that explains um, all these codes that you'll see. So normally you get back something like this, an AKIA, which is your own personal access key. If you assume a role, it'll come back with ASIA, which is a temporary key. Uh, you might also see things which uses roles, um, uh, like
like this one, A-R-O-A. And that comes back if you're using a, a role identity to perform some operations. So the first thing that's noticeable is that it's coming back with a temporary access key. It's coming back with a secret key that you should never show anyone. I'm showing you this one because it has no permissions and I will destroy it after the show. But the other interesting thing is it comes back with this session token. And whenever you create temporary credentials, it gives you this session token and you must provide it back when you make an API call. So you give it the access key, secret key, and the session token. Now, I haven't found any official documentation that says why the session token exists. My personal theory is that it contains some encrypted, encrypted permission information that tells the service what you are allowed to do. And rather than storing it, um, it makes you store it and pass it back each time and it's encrypted so it can verify that it's, it's running correctly. Uh, that's a huge token. Yeah, it's very big. You obviously don't type it in yourself. If you want to steal my credentials, go ahead. Um, the other thing you'll notice is it's got an expiration time. And if I say, what is the time on this particular machine? Um, now this is in UTC, so uh, it is currently 1.20 UTC and these credentials are expiring at around about 2.20. So you can see that it issued these temporary credentials for one hour, the default period. Uh, I could have asked for a longer time to go there. And um, it comes back and says the AR end of the role. Oh, here it is, here's an AROA. I'm, I, if I use those credentials, I'm using an AROA identifier. So uh, lots of interesting things to see there. So if you want to make an API call with those credentials, you give it the access key, secret key, and the session token. How do we get onto this? Must have been a question about this. Uh, yes, so the security token they mentioned in this particular question, uh, unfortunately has nothing to do with STS, uh, just to do with the program that they were running. I will delete that role. I don't want people taking advantage of it. Thank you. Uh, oh, instance key pair management. We have a Windows EC2 instance created. We need we have a need to remote desktop into the instance occasionally to execute a PowerShell script that updates Microsoft's Power BI gateway. Okay, so EC2 instance they want to remote desktop into it. This is implemented in a sandbox environment. We're looking at the steps actions to take to implement it in a production environment. From research, I have found that we need to have a different key pair for each user. I think this makes sense, but the logistics of implementing this is beyond my knowledge. I have some basic questions to help steer me. How do I generate a key pair for each user? Where are they maintained? How do I assign them? Do I create them? How do I rotate them, um, etc. Now, um, I jumped on this when I first saw it a couple of hours ago to ask them to please clarify what they mean by what they're asking for. So let's try and think about what's going on here. They want to connect to a Windows instance. They're using key pairs. So I think they're getting a little confused here. So when an EC2 instance launches for the first time, rather than giving a default Windows password like um, I love EC2 and having everyone try and steal each other's Windows instances, um, as you probably know, when you create a Windows instance, uh, it creates a random administrator key uh, password. That password gets encrypted using the key pair you nominate, and then you've got to come in here and say, oh, here's my key pair. I want to decrypt the password, and then it will give you the Windows password. Once you log in an instance, you are welcome to change the admin password and then only you know or hook it up to Active Directory, it's fine. But this is the, the first way to, to log in. So um, we don't recommend that you use that password or those key pairs for future logins. So without knowing more, uh, Jamod, who's a frequent answer, is saying, hey, you can use the run command to run things on the EC2 instance. So that, that's a good alternative to actually having to um, remote desktop in. Let's give some background here. So before I gave a comment, a comment is when you get to say, please clarify. What are you going on about? An answer is when you think this will answer the question. Um, Um, 
You can also programmatically uh, decrypt the password. There is an AWS CLI command to get Windows password. Uh, was it this one? Uh, retrieves the encrypted administrator password for running a Windows instance. So you can call uh, the AWS EC2 get password data for a particular instance. Um, oh, how do you give it the key, the key pair? Oh, it's encrypted using the key pair you specified. You must provide the corresponding key pair file. Uh, is that the private thing? This file contains the private key. Yep, so you can do it programmatically. There is also another thing you can do um right running there i'm going to start my windows instance here there's a quite a fascinating thing you can do with the get uh, system log so if i point this is a, a linux instance if i go in here and say get system log it shows me all of the information that appeared when my linux instance booted up and the important thing you want to go there is to see that it's running things like cloud init that runs your user data and um is waiting for the machine to log in. However, if you do it to a Windows instance, uh, not much information comes up. Take a few minutes to boot up. But if you're careful, you can actually see the encrypted Windows password coming through the log, the stuff that flows up on the screen when you boot a Windows machine. You can see the encrypted Windows password, and I've successfully grabbed that key pair off there, decrypted it using a command line and the key pair, and gotten the actual Windows password. So the way the Windows system, we've got some uh, code on the instance that generates the random password, prints it in that system log, the EC2 instance system then grabs that encrypted message and makes it available. Let's see if it's going to work now that this instance has launched. Not quite. And say, show me the screenshot of the instance. Always pretty. So it's, it's ready and it's saying you can hit Control Alt uh, Delete to unlock. Might not be lucky. Might only work first boot ups or something one last try get system log oh, sometimes you'll see the encrypted password there not today um so you can access uh, yes. So what should this person do? It looks like they occasionally have to log in and update this thing. They're talking about multiple users. Um, do they need to update to run a script? I'm going to say I also like jar mods idea using what was it the systems manager run command fantastic first question answered for today and one thing I've noticed um, if somebody adds an additional answer to a question, it goes above the existing answer, but I think it might be based on score. So if somebody says, I might upvote Jarmod's answer, and if I refresh this screen, now his answer is on top. So it seems to keep um, higher voted answers higher up, but recent ones higher up if they've got the same score, just something I've noticed. Upvoting is a good way to say, hey, this looks like a good answer. In doing so, a jar mod will receive some reputation points for answering it, and they'll go, oh, that's fantastic. And they will answer more questions, hopefully. So how many of you out there have ever asked a question on Stack Overflow? Lots of you have probably gone and, and searched on Stack Overflow. Have any of you ever asked a question on Stack Overflow? Um, let's do it by clicking the Ask Question up here, and it says, give a title, be specific, um, give a body, and tagging. Tagging is a great way to help classify questions. For example, 
I only look at questions tagged with AWS or uh, Amazon Web Services. So how many of you have ever, Greg, you've asked a question on there. Um, I have a confession to make. Uh, I have answered uh, over 5,000 questions on Stack Overflow, uh, but I have uh, never asked any questions. Um, why? Probably because I can find most of my answers by uh, Googling around and trying to find my own information. Um, but I've never actually asked anything on Stack Overflow. I'm probably missing a badge just by not asking a question, but uh, I've certainly uh, answered a fair few questions out there. Badges are always fun. Uh, here you can see some uh, badges I've got. I'm tracking for a badge called Legendary. I have no idea what it does. Uh, earn 200 reputation 150 times. <laughs> This relates to the concept of reputation on Stack Overflow. Uh, every time you ask a question, answer a question, or somebody upvotes your question or your answer, you gain reputation. And um, there's a limit of 200 reputation a day you can get. That doesn't include answers being accepted that give you 15 points of reputation. But otherwise, in a day, you can only get 200 reputation. So um, to reward you for potentially hitting that 200 limit, you can get a badge every time you cross that 200 threshold. So you can see I sometimes pass it. The reason I've gone beyond 200 is people accepted my answers, which always gives me additional points. And um, if I do that often enough, I qualify for this badge. So 64 times I have exceeded 200 reputation a day. And I'm seeking to do it 150 times. So uh, it takes a bit of work. I can track my uh, points. Yesterday, I only got 100 points. Looks like uh, um, every 10 points is somebody upvoting, every 15 points is somebody accepting an answer of mine. And today, I've earned 20 points. So, woohoo! Uh, Brad says, 70% of the time while I'm putting the information together for a question, I come across the answer. Very true. Um, I don't know if you've heard of the concept of rubber, rubber duck debugging. Uh, it has a Wikipedia entry. And the concept of rubber duck debugging is that if you explain your problem to somebody else, you will often figure out what's going on. And you go, oh, I wonder if I initialize the variable. And that will often solve your problem. And this is based on a famous story at a university where they had a teddy bear on a counter. And before you could ask for help, you had to explain your problem to the teddy bear. And most students would solve the problem themselves thanks to the teddy bear. So often at work, Somebody will turn to me and say, um, can you be my rubber duck? And I'll just listen to their problem and they'll figure out the solution. And I'll go, John, you are so good. And I didn't say a word. It was utterly fantastic. Quack overflow. Insights are often found by describing the problem aloud. What's quack overflow? Ah, oh, it must have been an April Fool's joke uh, on Stack Overflow. It looks like there is a video here. Quack overflow. Ask the duck. Wow, they could talk to it. Duck is thinking, the duck is typing. When you're stuck, rubber ducking is a powerful method for solving the most difficult problems. Quack. <laughs> so the answer is always quack. Okay, that must have been a Stack, over, uh, stack Overflow April Fool's joke from a while ago. How do we get onto this topic? Um, I can't find anything how to make public Twitch chatbot. A public Twitch chatbot. So you want to tie a chatbot into Twitch. I haven't seen Twitch. Now Twitch is an AWS, well no, it's an Amazon service. It is not an AWS service uh, API for chat. Oh no, there are, it is possible to create bots in chat because you can do these exclamation mark things and they all, um, connect to it. So it might be an IRC bot that you need to create to connect in. So yeah, just have a look at these various um, IRC things. Your bot might have to connect into IRC and then work that way. Um, there's a thing called Chatty that I use when I want to uh, look at chat. This is a Java app. And up somewhere here. It is. Um, it is a uh, IRC client that can connect into um, Twitch. So here I can see various usernames of people who are in Twitch. 
And if I say something uh, here in my chat, it comes up there. So Twitch chat is effectively IRC behind the scenes. So you can create a bot that does that. Um, does Twitch run on AWS? I'm not sure if Twitch runs on AWS. Twitch is a very interesting uh, historical service. Um, it was originally called Jason TV and which service uh, a fellow called Jason thought it'd be really interesting sorry Justin TV not Jason um, a fellow thought it'd be very interesting to stick a camera on his head and walk around and let people view his life and it, it took off with some degree of success the, I don't know if his girlfriends and all that liked it but they noticed that whenever he sat down to play video games the number of people watching increased and that's how they got the idea to do Twitch um, that people like watching other people play video games and that's where it all took off so uh, Twitch predates the Amazon acquisition. Um, they probably have moved a lot of their things on. And there's been a new service um, released just recently on AWS called Amazon Interactive Video Service, which is effectively your own private Twitch. So if you want to run your own Twitch, you can use IVS to uh, stream to IVS and then lots of people can watch uh, in real time. Uh, have chat and various things um, but it does cost whereas twitch is free to use thanks to advertising and things like that uh, is irc still around it's amazing how many services still use irc yeah it's still out there uh ben it probably needs a server to run since like nightbot how can anyone add it to their channel yeah so if you look in our chat and i do something like a uh, moobot uh nope if i do something like um YouTube, oh, um, what are the standard commands? Uh, GitHub. Okay, so we've got a thing called Moobot that is responding to my GitHub commands. For those of you watching this later on video, I typed exclamation mark GitHub and a bot responded in Twitch chat. So you can certainly create those things. Um, ah, this is an interesting question I saw. Uh, somebody's trying I was trying to scrape reviews of Amazon with beautiful soup which is beautiful soup is a great um JSON XML type um browser uh, and ran into this error message I love this to discuss automated access to Amazon please contact this for information about migrating to our APIs contact us here so uh, the historical the history of APIs actually with AWS is with Amazon is uh, Amazon, world's largest online shopping store, back in the old days, wasn't quite as big, but people started scraping information from Amazon because it was a great resource for information on books and things that they were selling. So a lot of people were grabbing information off Amazon to use on other sites. And Amazon decided, well, rather than having people scrape all these sites, because every time they changed the design of the web page or the scraping broke, uh, they created an API and it's called the um, Amazon... Uh, product API now and this is how you can connect into um, Amazon and retrieve you know what items match these keywords and can I add them to my shopping cart and things like that so amazon.com has an API to provide a whole lot of those services so what this um, message is basically saying is please don't scrape from our website please uh, use the API uh, yeah, it's open. You've got to create an account and you can grab like, yeah, not all information is there. I don't know if reviews can be scraped, but certainly product information is out there. And Amazon is happy for you to use Amazon product information on your website to um, lead to sales on Amazon. It's a great thing to do. And the reverse of this is I found a lot of people asking questions on um, Stack Overflow saying, how can I change my IP address? And if we say, why do you want to change your IP address every five minutes, whatever, they say, oh, I'm trying to scrape information off third party website and they're blocking me after a certain amount of time. So I need to change my IP address or run from five different IP addresses. So I normally put a comment there saying that, um, sorry, we don't encourage people to break the terms and conditions of other websites. So please check to see if there's an actual API you can use. Thank you very much. Uh, let's see if there's some other interesting questions here. Move files. Oh, coding time. I need to move all files of a subfolder to its S3 bucket root. Right now I'm using the AWS CLI command of AWS S3 move. It looks like they're trying to move a folder to the root of a bucket. 
My main issue is the subfolder changes every day after a Team City run. It's is it is any way to know if there's a new folder inside test folder two and copy its content to the S3 bucket root. I want to automate it so every day things are there. So um, let's try some live coding. So it looks like what they want to do is they want to go to a bucket and given a certain prefix, any objects in S3 under that prefix, they want to move to the root. Does that sound like something we can, uh, can try ourselves? Let's uh, try a bit of live coding here. So, ramp up, new file. I have a standard where I, whenever I write some code for Stack Overflow, I just save it in a stack.py file. Uh, import, I, I'm, a, I'm a Python person, so excuse me if I'm uh, doing this. So what do we want to do? We want to get all files in a particular folder and move it. Now, the interesting thing about Boto and S3 is there's two different ways to do every command. There's something called a resource and there's something called a client. You're doing JavaScript. Um, you can try it in JavaScript, uh, Engine again, um, and I'll try it in Python. And so to be nice and confusing, there's two ways to do things in, in Boto 3, which is the Python SDK for AWS. One is a client which maps one-to-one -one with AWS API requests. Another one is a resource, and a resource is a more Pythonic way to use AWS services. It makes shorter code, but it does not map one-to-one -one with AWS services. Um, I tend to use the client, but this time I think I'll use um, the resource just to give myself a little bit of practice. So I'll say that the S3 resource, which lets me play with S3, um, and then I can say, uh, I want to get a list of all objects in the bucket, which under the resource, I can do something like this. I can come in and say, for a given bucket, get me all objects. So I can say uh, bucket equals S3 resource bucket, and let's create a bucket. Uh, AWS S3 make bucket three stack move oh. and the bucket name is ah, I've got to give it a region I wonder what region it created it in I have shortcuts to jump to all my consoles it's really neat I guess the person wants to track first whether a new folder is available and then move the content. I'm going to ignore the fact there's folders because um, it doesn't really matter. Back move is created in Sydney. Fantastic. So I'm going to create my bucket called stack move. Then I can say for object in bucket dot objects. Now, rather than saying all, I can use the syntax to say, give me all objects in the bucket. I can actually give it a filter. And the filter can specify a prefix, I think somehow. Filter creates an iterable of all bucket resources. I want this on objects. Is this thing here. I'm going to say give me a uh, filter where prefix equals uh, foo one foo two. So let's give it some files. Uh, copy my X file to S3 stack move foo one foo two one dot text. So the great thing about AWS is you can, uh, S3, you can copy files to non-existent directories and they sort of exist. So I just copied something to the foo1, foo2 directory. If I go to S3, go into my stack move, and it looks like foo1 is created, it looks like foo2 is created, and I've got my object in there, but the old directories don't really exist because the truth is this object is actually called foo1, foo2, one.txt. Always gets people confused in the stack overflow, but 
Could be right. So I'm now saying get me every object that is within that prefix. And uh, for the moment, let's just print the object key. I don't remember if it's capital or not. Let's give that a run and try. Python 3 stack.py. Excellent. So it came back and it has said, I have found this particular one file, which is in the root, just to prove that it will work. Um, if I put something in the root, stack move root. Until it to copy. So, that didn't tell it to do S3. X does not exist. Um, sorry for all the shortcuts, but I'm basically just putting an object in the root of my S3 bucket. So, if I go back to this thing and refresh, we can see there is a file in the root. There's something in the food too, etc. So I just wanted to test my program that it is only picking up the uh, files that are in the foo1, foo2 directory, which is looking good. And then I can simply say um, glitch is a hosting site. Glitch, twitch, glitch. Um, let's now uh, object. Ah, you can't move objects in S3. You have to copy them and delete them. So I go back to the S3 documentation. Uh, I go back and say, show me an object. On an object, there is a command. Let me know if I'm going too fast for some of you. Uh, there is a copy command and it works as follows. It needs a copy source. So the copy source is equal to Find a bucket up here. Magic variables up the top. And the source is going to be object key. Then says you've got to run this command. Uh, oh, you run it on the bucket. Bucket X. Okay, so you've got a bucket. You've got an object. The object is the object you want to copy to, and then you say object copy source. Oh, that's weird. That's sort of backwards of the doing it the, the uh, client method. So you create a new object, and then you say copy from that object. That's that's interesting. Okay, let's do that. So I'm now saying the temporary object I'm going to copy to is in the existing bucket and it's going to be called ah now I need the end of the name of the key so I need the name of the object everything after the last slash and in python I think I can do that with an r find so uh quick cheat if I've got a string is equal to foo one foo two something is spelt r find will return that so I can simply say give me s r find the last the right hand slash to the end of it and plus one because I don't want to include the slash. So that's how I can get something out of it. So um, target key equals object key r find thingy plus one. So I can say send it to my target key. And finally, if I consult the documentation again, it says I should object.copy from that copy source. Now, I won't delete the object yet. Let's give a go if this is working. For those of you who just joined me, hi, my name is John. 
I'm answering questions on Stack Overflow and doing a bit of live coding while I'm doing it as well. Let's see if this will uh, work. Uh, oops, I closed the wrong window. Python 3 stack.py, what do you think, will it work? It says it found that one object. I didn't get any errors. Let's go to the S3 console and I'm going to refresh this screen and we want to see um, that text file appear here when I refresh and it worked. Well, that was pretty good. So theoretically, I can now add a command here to say uh, object. Now, it's confusing with all these words, so I'm going to say target. Whereas this is the original object, object.delete. And that should be enough. So let's load a few test files. To text. Let's put something in another subdirectory. Uh, oops, I put it in the wrong directory there. Let's go in foo1, foo2, foo text. And let's create another one and put it in foo3. So it's any subdirectory. If one text was already available, will it overwrite it? Yes, the copy command and uploading will always overwrite an object. In fact, there was a Stack Overflow question last week where somebody was saying, can I be notified or can it please error out? I don't want it to replace an object. And the answer is no, you've got to check if it exists first. Uh, but if you say copy it or create it, it will always get created. Thanks for that question, Wordsmith. Um, so let's clear out the root directory here. Try our great test. I have in foo1, I have foo2, which has two files. And in foo3, I have a third file. So when I run this, I want those three objects to disappear and move there. You might hear me alternatively saying file and object. Officially, an object in S3 is an object, it's not a file. You upload a file and it becomes an object. An object is immutable, so you can't go into an object and change one byte. If you want to change one byte, you've got to replace the whole object. Unlike on your disk file system, you can replace one byte. So I'll come in here and say, run my program. It should list three names. Come into my console and I refresh. Three of them are there. Now, foo1 still exists, which is worrying. So it looks like it did not delete those objects. So I have an error in my code. It looks like the object.delete did not work. It's upsetting me. Uh, let's go to the top and click on object. Go down to delete. And it should just work. So why did my object dot delete? Ah, you know what it was? I don't think I saved my program. <laughs> so um, let's copy a few more files and directories. Um, give it a go again. It's always good to save your code before running it. Back to the root. Get rid of these objects. This time for sure. So I expect these files, one and two and three, to be moved to the root. I also expect the foo directory to disappear because I didn't create the foo directory. It was only there as a partial path for an object. So foo, should, foo one should disappear. Give it a run. Three files copied and deleted. Come back into the console. And we now see they're in the root and the food one directory has disappeared because it never existed. It was only there because a file had that prefix in its name, which is always very confusing in S3. So after having such fun, I can post this code. Is there any cleanup that I want to do here? Um, get just the name after the last slash because that might be confusing for people. Delete the object. Copy the object. 
Uh, Brad says, hey John, when you say an object will always be overwritten by create object, what if the user has permission to put an object but not delete? Wouldn't that be a way to delete an object without permission? Uh, yes, uh, put an object will replace an object so you'll lose the contents, but it isn't deleting the object. If you have versioning turned on, then you're not even deleting the content of that original one. It will be a new version that is created. So yeah, if you're worried about people being able to delete, turn on versioning and that way even though they can overwrite it, you will never lose the content that was in that object at the time that it was overwritten. Versioning is a whole fun thing to play with. So, um, let's just change this to prefix. And give them an answer. Uh, if the filter was only foo1 and not foo1 foo2 then would it still achieve the goal? Yes, because I'm saying anything that starts with foo1 foo2, a file in foo1 would not be moved. Let's have a quick play with that. So if I was to come and go into put an object in foo1, so because this is in foo1 and my program is saying look in foo1 foo2 then when i run it it should not move that file so it is intentionally only looking in that prefix because the person who asked the question said i only want to move things from these particular folders but they don't know the name of that last folder so i'm cheating rather than looking for the name of the folder i'm simply saying hey anything that is in these folders and any folder underneath it can move and when i say any folder underneath it I'm not actually checking folders, I'm just saying anything that has that beginning bit, I don't care what it has after that. S3 works in mysterious ways. Let's give an answer. Well, when you put some code in um, Stack Overflow, you can fence it, which is the name given to these three little dots, and you can tell it some uh, formatting. So this tells it it is Python, so when it draws it, in Stack Overflow, it does some nice formatting in there. Uh, there is also the ability to put in some code with, never done it, uh, this thing. Nope, it just formats an indent. Uh, this one. Wow, I never knew there was code snippets in here. You can write some code. I could paste my Python in here, for example. I could run it, which won't do anything because it's in the wrong environment. But then I can say, wow save and insert into the post so you can see two different formats here this one that i just posted in the float says run code snippet puts it in a pretty box and now this one down here just gives the raw text if i was writing code that you could run straight in the browser and it didn't use aws etc i'd probably do that but um i do not wish to and you can see it's using this snippet command to do so i Will not do so. That will move any objects in given prefix. Into the root of the bucket. There's no copy command in S3, there, sorry, no move command in S3, there's only copy and delete. Oh, fantastic. I always get a buzz out of it when I write a small bit of code like this, get it working and post it up there. And occasionally I see my code elsewhere on the internet when other people are doing samples. So I wrote a little stopinator program one time and somebody put it in GitHub and then I see it reflected all over the internet. So it gives me a warm feeling when I do that. Time for a bit of a diversion. I've collected a few things during the week to entertain you with. Uh, this is a story I found on the internet. Amazon drivers are hanging phones in trees to get more deliveries. Can you figure out why people might want to hang phones in trees to get more deliveries? Well, it turns out there's a lot of people doing home deliveries these days because they're all stuck at home. And there are contract drivers for Amazon who get paid based on how many things they deliver, you know, much like Uber Eats, etc. And the story, uh, it's called Amazon Flex. That's the service where um, people can sign up and be um, drivers for Amazon. And they get business based on how far they are from the thing to be picked up. So if they're close to where people 
let's say if people want things from Whole Foods, if they're close to Whole Foods, they'll get the work more often. But to get those jobs, they're apparently hanging phones in the tree outside a Whole Foods store so that they get the work and they can pick up the job on a second phone that's tied to the same Amazon account or something. So uh, that's how people are doing it in Chicago suburbs or something. And some people believe a group might be behind the tree phone scheme. They may be charging drivers to secure more routes, routes which would violate Amazon's policies. So um, there you are. Uh, phones do grow on trees. Uh, if you want to be the uh, you want to be a driver for Amazon. Um, I, I live in Sydney, Australia, and they now have this in Australia as well. I understand. So the idea is you sign on for a certain amount of time. You reserve a block of time and say, I'm willing to work for this time period. They then assign you deliveries and you get paid based on um, the number of deliveries you make and the quality of your work. So they make sure that you do actually uh, deliver things. We're actively recruiting in San Francisco, Seattle, 50 US cities. Let's see, Amazon Flex in Sydney. Ah, Amazon, flex.amazon.com.au. There you are. If you are in Australia, you can sign up to be an Amazon Flex driver. And fantastic. I've been getting so many things delivered during this COVID time period. What's the, what's the latest thing you've bought off Amazon? Snap quiz. Um, when I joined Amazon, um, we all uh, sat in an orientation session and they went around and asked you to introduce yourselves and they asked, what's the last thing you ordered off Amazon? And I was in Australia before Amazon was in Australia, Amazon.com, and I used to just order books and things from the US, but I was amazed by the, um, the variety of things that people would order. Uh, the last thing you bought, a dual monitor mount. Yeah, they're great to have two monitors up. One thing I've discovered with the dual monitors is it's best to have one monitor directly in front of you and a second monitor off to the side, maybe in vertical landscape, vertical, vertical, vertical mode so you can see things. But I hate having two monitors where the gap between the monitors is directly in front of me. Um, so I've learned to always have one monitor directly in front of me. But uh, those mounts are great. Vertical landscape. Yeah, it's, you know, mountains, things. What else has somebody bought out there? What have you last bought off Amazon? Um, yeah, horizontal. Ver the, the vertical one's great for reading web pages and the horizontal one's great for doing um, word processing type. I work out there. Come on, folks, what have you bought off Amazon lately? Or your favorite shopping service? Um, related story, a guy in the UK had a lot of cars driving past his house, so he put 100% prepaid Android phones in a trolley outside his house to make Google Maps think there was a traffic jam and therefore route drivers away from his street. That's an interesting way of doing it. There is, of course, the... Um, way. What's the... Uh, is an Israeli navigation program that's bought by Google. Um, it's not Waymo, Waze. The uh, Waze uh, GPS navigation system uh, is crowdsourced. So you can report uh, traffic accidents and things like that. And I think Google Maps now has that too. And I heard stories of people in small communities who didn't want lots of cars coming down their street. Uh, several of them would get together and, and each report that there's a something blocking the road and the navigation system will route people away from those particular streets. So uh, it's pretty neat. Here's a similar question. Is copying S3 bucket from one account to another account secure in transit? Oh, that's interesting. I'm looking to copy the contents of one S3 bucket to a different account. I found the following tutorial and tested it with non-confidential files. It's all about copying objects across accounts. Nice. I'm wondering if any data that is transferred between the accounts using this method is secure as in encrypted in transit. Is it using AWS to do a direct copy or is it using the computer running the sync as the middleman? So does it download and upload? I do have uh, server-side encryption enabled on the bucket. I did see recommendation about KMS was not clear. So somebody's saying that they think it uses HTTPS. If you're using the CLI, it will use the port. Um, none of this actually answered the, um, the transfer question. So um, if you are copying data between buckets and the buckets are in the same region, using Markdown to get bold,
going to use this term backplane. I don't know if it's common in there. Backplane is the stuff where running in your own internal network but never exposed to the outside world. If you are copying between regions, uh, when using the copy command. Yeah, he's using the CLI, so it's really the CP sync commands. The nice thing is it does not download and upload. It just tells S3, please copy. That's what we just did in our last program. Please copy from this location to that location. It all happened in S3. There was no copying required. Um, you're copying between buckets in the same region if you're copying between regions uh, and if you are concerned that copying is too slow you can actually run multiple threads and you can issue multiple copy commands in parallel and S3 will utilize lots of bandwidth to uh, go and do that very quickly. Another question answered. I always like to check the tags. Here they put an S3 tag on it. I will also add a Amazon Web Services tag, make it easier to identify. And it also uh, gives me credit for answering an Amazon Web Service question. We recently passed 100,000 questions tagged with Amazon Web Services. So I always like to keep that up to date if possible. And who do we have to thank recently? Uh, Marson in Western Australia, I think, uh, answering lots of questions. Chris Williams in the UK, good work, folks. I'm lagging behind lately. I challenge you all to appear on these lists. Uh, if Greg says, if it's on the AWS backplane and AWS doesn't, then AWS encrypts the data in transit for you. Also, is the data encrypted in transit if you're accessing S3 via VPC endpoint? Um, when you make an API call to S3, uh, you normally make a call to the HTTPS endpoint. So both your API request and the um, data itself will be encrypted. So yes, make sure you're using HTTPS as your communications point. Um, if you're going across the black back plane, does it encrypt? I said in my answer there that I believe it is. I, I never do anything solidly if I... Um, Question. Back to here. Um, I said, uh, I believe it's also encrypted while being copied in the back plane. So I remember seeing something recently that all data between systems is now encrypted, but unless I can give an actual reference to that, I never like to officially say that is true. So, but I believe it is, but um, I can be proven wrong. Um, if you look at some of our, um, resources out there they will give more firm statements delving into our, our global infrastructure there's also a great website awsamazon.com security which has uh, an awful lot of information about security and it will somewhere in there give the answer about it if it is of concern to you please contact your account manager or your technical account manager and they will be able to give you a definitive reference on how that data is encrypted in transit um, uh, that question ask that question also mentioned they encrypt the data at rest, but S3 will decrypt it when the data is read because the destination bucket might be encrypting things differently, like with a different KMS key. So it decrypts it, transports it, I believe encrypted, and then encrypts it when it goes at rest. Yeah. Uh, oh, is there 
a cold storage IDS backup option cheaper than storing snapshots. So it looks like this person is not happy with the cost of snapshots. They're using Postgres. Is there a form of cold storage of database that costs less than snapshots? I can export a snapshot to S3 and move it then to Glacier. It's not really restorable. Some kind of PG dump that writes to Glacier. Let's have a look at pricing here. See what they're complaining about. Uh, they're using Postgres. And snapshot export. That so looks like a snapshot is charged at one cent per gig, resume per month. Charge per gig of snapshot size. Oh no, no, snapshot export is a different service, sorry. Snapshot export provides a method to export data uh, to S3. This could be an answer. This could be an answer. We'll come back to that. Uh, backup storage. So a normal backup storage using snapshots is charged at nine and a half cents per gig. So let's have a look here. Ah, oh, the question was closed, wasn't it? I can't answer because they say it's not a programming question. This is always a problem. Is AWS programming? Is it not? Uh, the code that I just wrote is definitely programming this. It's questionable, but I'll be able to add a, an answer here. Uh, normal snapshots are 9.5 cents per gigabyte per month. A snapshot export command, one cent per gigabyte. Now this is something fairly new. Uh, provides an automated method to export within an RDS or Aurora snapshot to S3 in Parquet format. Parquet is great, it's, an ob it's a columnar data format that if you're using like Athena, it can really read uh, the, the data really quickly. It doesn't have to scan the whole file, it's sort of indexed, uh, which is really, really good. The only problem is how would you get the data back from the Parquet file into Postgres? And that's the real biggest problem. Um, I know that PostgreSQL has a PG dump command. So the nice thing about the PostgreSQL PG dump command is it outputs pure SQL. So it says things like create table, insert row, uh, grant access and all that. And so not only is it an exported file, but you can simply run the PG dump file through a Postgres command line and it will recreate everything you've got. So I did that to copy data um, in a previous job between two Postgres databases. I said uh, PG dump on one machine and then I piped the output into a PSQL command on a second machine and it immediately imported the data into the second machine and it was all, it didn't even have to save it to a file. Running the... Uh, sorry, Brad, you were um, referring, uh, if I still want to add an answer, what does that mean for a question to be closed? Does that not show up for other people looking for questions? So. If a question is closed like this one, uh, it's closed because it didn't meet the guidelines. It's normally nice if people put a comment of why they're closing it, and it's typically because it's not program related. Um, you can't add another, you can't add an answer to it, but the question asker is welcome to edit their question, make it in scope for Stack Overflow, and then people can vote to reopen the question, and then it can appear again. I rarely see that happening because it needs people to say reopen it and it's hard to get those things so often people just post a new question that meets the guidelines to get in there uh, sometimes i close a question by marking it as a duplicate so if i go to a question here oops that's using uh let's go to this question and pretend that i had a a duplicate answer so somebody else has already answered this question 
uh, I could pick that particular thing. And then if I said vote to close, um, I have enough reputation on certain tags that I can immediately close a question by marking it as a duplicate, as long as that duplicate has an answer which has been upvoted or, or accepted. So I could, with one shot, shut down a question and mark it as duplicate. But I then add a, a, a message, a comment onto that one saying, if you don't think this duplicate one uh, matches your question, then let me know and I will reopen the question. And I do that sometimes. If somebody says, no, my question's a bit different, I can unclose the question as being a duplicate and people can answer the question again. So they've really thought out this whole system quite well. Time to entertain you again with some interesting story I have collected. Um, let's find it. Ah, here we are. Um, my sound, my sound is not great set up here. So I'll put this link in the chat. And uh, this is a fellow who I believe works for Cloud Guru, and he has created a two-minute song on YouTube that has all the names of the 168 or more. AWS services. So I invite you to uh, have a listen to that uh, video. It's Quite fun. I didn't uh, get to hear all the names of services got in there, but hopefully uh, they're all existing and you probably have to update it again next week with uh, more services. Thank you very much. Um, ah, here's an interesting fun fact. Um, uh, Amazon Redshift, our uh, petabyte scale data warehouse. There's an interesting entry here in the Wikipedia entry that suggests the name a redshift is uh, means to shift away from Oracle, red being an allusion to Oracle whose corporate color is red and is informally referred to as big red. Now I never realized that. I thought redshift has got to do with space and travel and things moving really fast, but um, this is at least suggesting, well, it's got a reference. Let's have a look at the reference. It's saying redshift is a poke at Oracle. And that is indeed a red logo. So somebody here is suggesting that that's what the uh, the name is for. And yet the icon is blue. <laughs> Fun fact of the day. Let's see if there's some more questions we can answer here on Stack Overflow. I shall go to my list of questions that I bookmarked earlier. We have done that one. We have done that one. How to deploy, oh, somebody's answered this in the meantime. How to deploy a web library to S3 with versioning. Uh, for those of you who just joined, hi, my name's John. I'm a developer advocate with AWS. I like answering questions on Stack Overflow, so I thought I would do it with all of you, my friends, and we might learn some things on the way. Uh, Gak Gamoxion apparently has a web library made under JavaScript, and I'd like to automatically deploy it to a repository on S3 and keep keeping versioning. My current process is manually assigning a variable with the version I'm deploying and then uploading everything to S3 as a static website. However, under that process, I cannot keep multiple versions on my repository at the same time. I need a way I can pass a parameter as version and deploy everything to my repository. What's the best way to achieve it? Um, so Andre IDK has given an answer saying you should just create a subdirectory, which I quite like. Um, versioning within S3 is not the versioning he's really, um, Gamoxion is really talking about. So I don't think that's a good way, but I agree with this. So I shall simply give it an upvote. The uh, answer was put in there since I last saw the question. Can't they, yeah, because in S3, you can't sort of put a question mark V version equals type name. You've got to use a slash in there to go to a different directory. Ah, here's something I see a fair bit. I wanted to be able to monitor logs in CloudWatch when my Lambda function is, is being executed. Currently, there's a section at the top of Lambda console that says execute, sorry, execution failed um, and go to logs. It's showing me an error. But when I click logs, it'll direct me to CloudWatch 
show me log group does not exist. I thought it would be automatical. And um, the fact is, there is an IAM role that it is recommended that you attach to every Lambda function. It's called a Lambda. Oh no, it's a policy. Lambda. Always misspelling. And it's this thing here, Lambda basic execution role. And the Lambda basic execution role uh, attaches three permissions here. One is it can create a log group, it can stream to the log group, and it can put events in the log group. And that's what allows the Lambda function to write to CloudWatch. And you can even lock it down further and say which log group it's allowed to use. So this permission or these permissions should be attached to the Lambda function. And yet, let's have a look at the answers that are given here. Uh, the most common cause is this, you have not assigned an IAM role to your Lambda function. It didn't say what role should be assigned. Your log group should be automatically created. If you click on the arrows, it should work. No, nope, that's not true. Let's give it the truth. Um, it was Lambda function. This is Jason. Create a log group store events. So the easiest way is you can come in here and grab this thing called Lambda basic execution role. Managed policy. Fantastic. Uh, I often make that mistake myself, which is how I know that's the particular answer. So you've got to make sure it has the CloudWatch logs permissions to go in there. Ding! I need a bell to ring every time I answer a, a Stack Overflow question here. This one has three answers. We'll see who gets the votes. Vote for me. Vote for me. Um, okay, a bit of diversion. Um, I've been playing with uh, Workspaces recently. Workspaces is, we call it a desktop in the cloud. It's a service where you can spin up a uh, remote um, um, you can spin up a remote desktop in the cloud, connect to it and start using it. And typically this is done with Windows. When you connect to a Windows workspace, it gives you a full Windows environment, which is great if you're on a Mac or a tablet or something like that. But also good for Windows users who want to keep all of their work things in the cloud. And no matter where they connect from, they can access all of their resources. And the nice thing is it uses um, a client that connects in. It passes through your um, your keyboard, your mouse, your uh, microphone, so it all works quite nicely. And I've been using that a fair bit, but then I discovered there's also a workspace available for Linux. And I thought, oh, that's quite interesting. Um, how is that, oops, spaces. How is a Linux desktop going to work? And how is it different to using EC2? So uh, here is the pricing for Amazon Workspaces. And uh, you'll see here, there's a number of different options. There's a Windows bundle where you can get uh, a Windows machine going. And you can also ask for, um, you can ask for additional Microsoft Office products. So for an additional $15 a month, you get license for the uh, Microsoft products. But instead of going Windows, let's have a look at Linux. So we can spin up some Linux boxes here. Let's compare them to EC2. It looks like this one has one CPU and two gigs of memory. Let's compare that to EC2 instance. Um, we had one CPU and two gigs of memory. I don't know what that actually maps to. Maybe a T2 instance. Here we are, a T2 small has one CPU and two gigs of memory. 
and a T2 small has a price for Linux of around about T2 small, here we are, has a price of around about 2.3 cents an hour. So if we compare that to workspaces, uh, it's much more expensive. It's um, $21 a month or Ah, but it includes disk storage or 17 cents an hour. That's a bit hard to compare the prices, but let's uh, let's spin one up. I created one earlier. This um, uh, Linux workspace, and the way you do it is you run a workspaces client, and workspaces clients are available in many different varieties. You've got uh, Windows, Mac iPad, Android, Fire tablets, your web browser. So you, that's the neat thing. You can access a remote Windows machine or a Linux machine via your web browser. We should give that a go, actually. Come back to that. So I will go in and use my workspace. Password here somewhere. And what's interesting is, you don't SSH into a Linux workspace. They have installed a, a graphics user interface called Mate. I personally haven't heard of this before, but Mate is like GNOME. It's one of these graphical user interfaces that fits on top of Linux. And let's make it a bit bigger. Make it that big. So here I have my Linux workspace and it's got all these applications. I've got, um, Firefox. Now I chose the cheapest machine here. It's only got like half a gig of memory. I might have needed to give it a little bit more RAM, but this is facing it. Looks like it works quite nicely. The uh, web page running within the browser. Uh, looks like they've got LibreOffice, which is a open source version of Microsoft Office compatible software. See, here is a spreadsheet. But the spreadsheet works so that is not a uh, web-based spreadsheet this is a java-ish web i think working on linux quite nice uh, graphics program they've got a drawing program in here so um pretty neat all running off a, a linux desktop and you didn't have to install it yourself it all came pre-installed with this mate software so um mate is a neat de must be australian made <laughs> <laughs> that's funny um calculator take a screenshot um so there uh if you don't want to give your uh money to a, a company that makes operating systems and software you can go totally uh open source by using the mate system let's have a look uh, i was using this bottom end one so it has two gigs of memory one cpu at 21 dollars a month Let's try that web browser option. So if I quit out of my client, I go into the browser. Let's see if I can access that Linux system via web browser. Ah, didn't work too well. Web access launch. Again, doesn't like me. Try another browser. Me, you don't want to see me. Last chance. Actually, I'll try it on Safari. Web access. Not supported. Try it in Safin. Firefox, last chance. And it's not working. Oh, well, that would have been a very impressive demo had it have worked. So um, you can apparently normally use web access. Maybe it only works with the Windows one and not the, the Linux one, not too sure. So uh, yeah, I found that quite fascinating that Workspaces is now available in um, Linux.
And the nice thing is you can start and stop it and only pay for it when you use it for a small monthly charge. Done. Here's a question. Um, now, here's a question of something that will normally get closed pretty quickly because it's not a very detailed question. Um, they're saying, I want to know if RDSDB instance point changes after failover. Now, Stack Overflow is a site for programming question and answers. I can understand that RDS, our relational database service, is not really programming, but also they didn't put much effort into the question. So you'll see questions often being shut down. But somebody did manage to get an answer in here before it does it. Uh, the endpoint does not change. So it's worth talking about. When you launch an Amazon RDS database, you get given a DNS name, um, something something dot RDS dot Amazon, etc., that will point you to the database. And if you are running a multi availability zone, a multi AZ RDS database, you actually have two instances. You have a master instance and a secondary instance. And in this day and age, I'm trying not to use the word master. What's primary and secondary? Let's use those words. A primary instance and a secondary instance. If anything goes wrong with the primary instance, um, the endpoint will automatically be pointed to the secondary instance. The secondary instance boots up, gets going again. Your data has already been copied across and you can use it. So the simple answer to this one is, is that uh, the endpoint doesn't change. And that's the whole idea. The application should not worry about what's happened to the database. It just connects to a database endpoint and gets going quite nicely. So thank you, Shihaya, for answering that question. Uh, what else is fun here? Oh, this was interesting. Is there a way to list all services historically used on AWS, excluding CloudTrail? So CloudTrail is an audit trail service that every API call you make is uh, recorded and you can see what's happening. If you've never played with CloudTrail, it's, it's quite wonderful. Uh, it's a way of seeing every API call that has been made to your service. And when you use the console, it also gets recorded in CloudTrail. So here, for example, we can see what I've done recently. Uh, apparently I created a bucket. So I can click on that event and it tells me um, who made that request. So it's an AK, so I can see that's a normal set of access credentials, not temporary credentials. Uh, it was done in the Sydney region and it was done on my stack move bucket. So this was the command we did a while ago to create the stack move bucket. And I get a whole lot of interesting information. I can see that it was my user on my Mac that did it because I labeled that as a Mac CLI. That was the access key that was used. Here's the time it was done. Um, oh, it was done through a web browser in Boto. Um, and I can see the bucket name that was done and where the request was run. So really, really good for getting information about every API call that was made to your account. Let's try and find another one. Uh, I started an EC2 instance at some stage. So it's coming through and saying uh, the console. From the console, I launched an instance and the instance ended with 1.1. One, one. If we have a look at my EC2 console, I have an instance ending with 1.1. One, one. It was my Windows instance that I was doing when I wanted to demonstrate uh, how to use passwords with it. It wasn't there. So um, CloudTrail, fantastic, good way of seeing exactly what's gone on and especially for requests that do not work. So if somebody tries to make a request and um, they've, they fail, it can be recorded in CloudTrail and you can have an alarm that says, oh, too many failed attempts seem to be happening in CloudTrail. Uh, something funny is going on. So, uh, sorry, I just saw your question, Elite. Is a secondary a replica? Yeah, so when you use multi-AZ on RDS, ADS, RDS, multi-AZ, let's see if there's a nice picture here. Yeah, yeah something like that. So you, um, when you spin up a multi-AZ RDS database, it spins up a master or a primary instance which runs everything. It also spins up a secondary instance and the secondary instance is not running as the database. It's sort of turned off, but ready to run. And at a lower level, the data is copied from the primary instance to the secondary instance. So all of the data is being copied at the storage layer. And that means if anything goes wrong with the primary instance, uh, we automatically turn on the secondary instance. It's already got the data, so it just takes a minute or two to turn on, and then you reconnect to the database for the same DNS name, and you just keep using it exactly as it was there before. So it's a second copy of the database in a different availability zone, 
but behind the scenes we are replicating the data across for you. So what do they say when you have data backups? You've got the RTO and the RPO. RTO, R, P, O or something. Uh, the recovery time objective and the recovery point objective. So the recovery time says how long it takes for you to recover from a failure. In this case, it's a couple of minutes to get the database up and going. And the recovery point objective says how much data you'll lose. So by using multi-AZ, you actually do not lose any data. So it's um, no data lost. So it's a zero, it's an immediate recovery point objective and a few minutes to get your time. Going. Where were we? We were playing with uh, this thing. Uh, I'd like to find a way to list all AWS services used on an account. Uh, thanks. Um, and... Uh, having thousands of accounts. Wow. I can't use CloudTrail. That's silly. Config only provides data on infrastructure like EC2. Let's have a look at that. Config. So two services, CloudTrail and Config. CloudTrail stores every API call that was made. Please start my instance. Please stop my instance. CloudTrail will record that. Um, config. I should have it up and going here. Uh, where's my config? Why is it not running? Good, I do have it. Okay, so config is recording my configuration. So if you're used to ITIL and configuration management databases, that's what config is. It records that at this point in time, so here I have my Windows instance. It has that same ID we were looking at before. And I can come in here and it says, oh, it's a T2 medium instance. It's got this IP address, etc." But the really, really neat thing is I can call up a configuration timeline and it shows me historically what my instance was doing. So here we are. Uh, I am currently in the 10th of September in Sydney. You might be in the past, you might be in the future. And I can see that 1127, which is about an hour ago, an event took place. And I can look at that event and it was a start instances event. And there were four changes made to the instance at that time. The state name changed from stopped to running. The launch time changed from my previous launch time that was back in July uh, to September. And um, it cleared out a shutdown re reason. So config is great at historically looking at things that changed at a particular point in time. For example, uh, it was running and it was stopped or it changed security groups. Ah, the other neat thing is I can look at relationships. And I go back to this resource. Oh, here it is, relationships. I can say this EC2 instance is using this network interface, this IP address, this subnet, this, etc. So if I look for the uh, security group, I can then say, show me the configuration of that security group and I can look back in time and see what changes were made to that security group. It looks like um, the security group, oh look, so a whole lot of things changed. So I had some IP addresses on there and it changed to a different set of IP addresses. So it's got a full history and that's really the main difference. Cloud Trail says command was issued, start, stop. Whereas config says here is the historical information related to resources. Now, not every resource. It's typically a resource that is in a VPC, EC2 instance, security group, subnet, those sorts of things. But it's a really great way of seeing what has happened. And there's some additional services in config where you can run compliance checks. It might be things like don't open up security groups to the entire world. And uh, config can continually run these checks looks like this instance was non-compliant for something at some stage uh some mysterious config rule ending with wu said it was bad go back to aws config look at my rules um i don't have any running here though i rules here that's any oh well for some reason, it highlighted that machine as not being satisfying some rules. So, uh, they don't want to use CloudTrail. Is there an API to, or preferably an aggregator of some sort? I'd be interested in a simple output like account service when first consumed. Now, this reminds me a little bit of IAM. Now, IAM has 
you can say for each user, when did they last access things? Um, so I can see for my roles, which role did they access and how long ago did they do that? So that's really good. You can see roles that aren't being used uh, or users that aren't being used for a long time and turn them off. I think Netflix, uh, I am pretty, I, Netflix created a program, like might be this one, uh, which looks at permissions assigned to people over time. Removes permissions granting access to unused services from inline policies in IAM roles of AWS. It's called Repo Kid. So what they do is you give a certain amount of permission to users, but you're never sure how much permission you should give it. And uh, this program will look historically and see what permissions people are using. And if they're not using permissions, it will remove them because sometimes something will accidentally happen because people have permissions to do something they really shouldn't have permissions to do. And Repo Kid does it. So they've automated the reduction of security permissions. We always say you should assign uh, least permissions to people, and that's a nice automated way of doing it. Those of you who just joined me, hi, my name's John. I'm answering Stack Overflow questions about AWS. Um, so somebody here is suggesting, uh, oh, this was me. <laughs> if you're part of an AWS organization, you could use consolidated billing. So AWS organizations gives you the ability to join together multiple accounts in AWS for security and billing purposes. So they might be able to just use a roll up billing amount and use the bill to figure out which services are being used. Uh, somebody here, McFinnigan, is also saying, have you looked at your AWS bill? That could be a good way of doing it. However, I need to access information on a weekly basis for thousands of accounts. Not all of them have Cost Explorer enabled. Billing and usage, perhaps, can you not do an aggregator call? So, hence I asked my question about are they part of AWS organizations? But I also often like asking, adding a question like this one, why do you want to do this? Um, have you ever heard of the three whys or the five whys? Uh, there is a standard technique uh, called the five whys, an interrogative, iterative interrogative technique to explore the cause and effect relationship underlying a particular problem. Uh, for example, um, the vehicle won't start. Why? The battery's dead. Why? Alternator's not working. Why? The alternator belt that charges the battery is broken. Why? It was beyond its serviceable life. Why? Uh, it wasn't maintained well. So the immediate problem is the battery's not working. The real problem is you haven't been maintaining your car. And um, a lot of the Japanese manufacturing firms use uh, Six Sigma and the five whys to get to the root cause analysis of why things are going wrong. So I often like to ask people, why do you want to do this particular thing? So rather than helping them solve this little thing, I like to help them solve the bigger question that they're really trying to achieve. Um, so it might be, I'm having trouble passing this parameter to a command, or why are you running that command? You should use this other command. It's often a good way of solving things. Refresh this list. Okay. Um, make it impossible to download audio files. How do I prevent users from downloading audio files from my web app by accessing the S3 URL? I want to make it impossible to download audio files. Any suggestions? Now, Brad, is that you, Brad, who's Brad's on this call? Might be a different Brad. Says, I assume you may want to make it impossible to download files, but allow streaming. You can't. If it can be played, it can be downloaded, uh, which is very true. If something is public, it's not you, Brad's, okay. Uh, if something is public on S3, if someone can access it, they can grab it. Um, streaming, sometimes there's some streaming protocols that make it a bit harder, but there's often some utilities that can still download streaming information. So that's it. And I very much agree with what he says here, using pre-signed URLs. So I'm going to do something here, which is editing somebody else's answer. Now. A lot of people frown on this because they think, well, how dare you change somebody else's answer, but I'm going to improve their answer. So I have enough permissions to come in here and I'm going to put a link in here from uh, signing your URLs. I have a little shortcut that I use whenever I reference Amazon S3 pre-signed URLs. So what I've done in here is I've added a link in their answer that will take them to the documentation to explain it. So, uh, Hopefully Brad won't mind that I have edited his answer and made it slightly a bit better. And a way of saying terribly sorry for that, I will upvote Brad's answer. 
Look at this. He has the same reputation as me. I have 139,950. He has 139,286. Well, no, I've, I've got less. He's got a little bit more. And I just upvoted him. Don't mind. He's doing a good job out there. Um, have a look. Audio pump. He does audio stuff, which means he's a very good person to answer a question about streaming audio software. That's fantastic. Big answer of PHP, JavaScript, etc. In Illinois. That is a very attractive corn hat there. Okay. Um, here's another question I thought important enough to mark and go through. It's from a few days ago. Why did I mark this one? Uh, AWS Lambda, create folder in S3 bucket. I have a Lambda that runs when files are uploaded to S3 and moves those files to another S3. Okay, so looks like people upload, something gets created in a S3 bucket A and the Lambda function moves it to S3 bucket B for some reason. The challenge, I need to create a folder inside the B bucket with a corresponding date ah, of upload of files and move the files to the folder. Any ideas are greatly appreciated. Sounds like coding time. What has somebody else said here? Chris Williams, who's a great AWS answer. Um, there's no such thing as a folder. You might want to do blah, blah, blah. Um, but nobody has given them some code. So let's see if we can do this challenge. They want a Lambda function that moves from one bucket to another bucket inside a folder with the time that the date was uploaded. I did ask a question here a couple of days ago. Um, do you want to use a time from the file name from inside the file or the current time? And also be careful of time zones. So um, my time zone, you know, it's currently uh, Thursday for me. It might not be Thursday for you. So the date is always going to be a bit of a problem there. And it looks like the question asker has said they've tried to do a bit of Python here. It's hard to read. And they're trying to use Python to create the name on the directory. Give me a hint as to how I can pass the date to the path. Uh, let's just try and do it, shall we? Let's rev up our Lambda. And create. This is going to be called stack date move. Like Python. We'll give it some permissions to use. Okay, so we are going to be using a S3 thing. So I've just gone in the test options for S3. And this is showing me the typical data that is passed to a Lambda function if it is triggered by an S3 event. And we can see that it is passed the bucket name and it is passed the object key. Uh, Elite Pilot says essentially looks like a problem of trying to pass a variable as part of the key when uploading an object in the SDK. Yeah, so they probably haven't figured out that you just put it in the path of the key that you should put it in. So let's try it ourselves. We want to extract the bucket and the object. Uh, S3, I will create a test case there. Um, now, it is never good to write code from scratch. So I'm going to pop into another function that I have and I have a bit of code here yay this is going to uh, import URL lib remember that so so this little bit of code is very handy Uh, it will extract the bucket and the key from that event that is past their import date time. Okay. What date time import date? I'll believe you there, Prajopa. So we now have the bucket and the key of the incoming thing. Let's go back and look at the question they're asking here. They're receiving in bucket A and they want to move it to bucket B. So let's get our buckets stack move a
Back move B. On stack move A, I want to create somewhere an event. And I can say, please, when somebody creates an object in this bucket, trigger my lambda function called saved yet. Save my lambda function back here. Oops. Get an event again. Lambda. Date, date move. That's the one. And move files. That will trigger the lambda function when it runs. Let's code this together. Uh, what have I got to do? Um, we need to copy. So that sounds like the uh, copy command we used before. Whereas before we used resources, we use clients this time. Um, copy object, clients and resources. Yeah, I'm going to use a client this time because copying a file is pretty straightforward and easy. So it's S3 client equals Bodo 3 S3. If I have to say the region, I'll help it will default to the right region. So uh, target, how does this work? We have to provide a copy source, which can be a string and when we copy it, we tell it what bucket we want to copy it to and what key we want to copy it to. So this could be straightforward. Let's see. We want to say S3 client copy object. Sorry for bouncing back and forth. Copy object. The bucket is the destination bucket. Move B. The key that we want to move it to is, oh, I don't know that yet, so we'll just mark it as dest key. The source, that has to be lowercase. The copy source is going to be, this is going to be a hard bit. Copy source equals, now this has got to be the name of the bucket. Let's do an F string. I love F strings in Python as long as you're using Python 3.6 onwards. This is going to be the bucket followed by a slash followed by the key. Why is the F is Miller head of AI business Amazon Pocky Pocky? I have no idea. Uh, copy source. So we are copying from that bucket from that key to this bucket that key. And we want to do something with a date. So let's now figure out our date stuff. Um, date string equals date today plus file name. I am I going to believe you? I'm hopefully going to believe you. So I love it doing pair program and coding. Program coding is fantastic. So let's see what you've got here. Um, so you're saying date today. What what format will that give? ROM date time import date date today. That will give a, a stringy, but the question is what happens when it converts to a string? Oh, oh, oh. I need a slash. Oh yeah, I'll put the slash in there. Um so that is pretty good. When it converts it to a string, it gives me ISO format output, which looks really good. Ah, oh, hold it. Looks like that'll meet their needs. I like that. Thanks for that, uh, Prajalpa. So um, that'll give that format slash and then the key of the original object. Quotes on the slash, yep. 
Um, we give this a go. What I can do is, ah, let's try it and see. S3, we go into the bucket where the function has been attached. We upload file, my demo files. Here is a cat picture. Upload that file. I'm presuming nothing will happen. Let's go to our bucket B by changing the URL. And nothing is there. That's what I expect. So we then go and debug. Debugging is your friend. I was working uh, recently tutoring some uh, school groups on Python in a program called the National Computer Science School in Australia. And they have an online uh, challenge. Uh, it was a, a tutor online there. And the organizer of this thing made a very good point that normally in school, fail is a bad word. If you fail a subject, that's terrible. You never want to do it. But in computing, things fail all the time. In fact, they always go fail, 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 fail. And as soon as they don't fail, then you're done. So most of your life is spent with failure. And teaching this concept to um, new programmers is, is an interesting concept that don't be afraid of failure. Uh, it's just telling you what you've forgotten to do. And um, uh, you shouldn't be so lazy. So I have my output here. It's saying, uh, ah, I wrote <laughs> in my client function up the top. So each dot client. Now I can use the test function here now that we've uploaded a file into S3. So what I can do is configure the event. I'm going to go into here and say the bucket stack move a the key was cat.jpg and the great thing now is I can just save this sample function and I can hit test and it will test it totally within here uh, Bodo 3 is missing silly me I didn't import Bodo 3 save test much faster turn around here unsupported type of date time time and string and that is presumably in here so I can just convert that string test uh, key is not defined capital K key uh, date string what have I done here my dest key call that dest key going to be that line 16 this key is not defined it's a lowercase key I sound British or not Australian? I, I have been told that I sound British, yes. But I, I'm Australian, mate. You want me to sound Australian? I'll turn on my Paul Hogan accent and just talk like this for a little while. Makes you happier, elite. Uh, g'day. What going? Oh, it ran. Ha ha. It ran. We go and refresh over here. It has copied into a folder called that particular date. And it has created the cat. Yay. New South Wales or South Australia where the accent is slightly more British. Ah, I can tell the uh, the accent in Queensland. In Queensland, they talk a little bit slower and we make lots of jokes between states. But uh, here in New South Wales, we talk very fast because we're all very busy. Ah, Okay, working code. Now, the only thing that this code is not doing is adjusting for time zone. And the reason for that is Lambda functions run in UT UTC and the person might not be wanting the function to run in UTC, so they actually want it to do differently, but I think it's good enough, mate. And and we may as well give them this code. Here's Lambda function, mate. That will, can be triggered by an Amazon S3 event, mate. And move the object to another bucket, mate. Uh, Python. Beautiful. And the only thing to consider. Now, officially, when you talk Australian, you shouldn't move your lips because the flies get in. And actually, since we're doing this, um, I'll explain a little bit of a uh, little bit of strain to you. Um, so what language am I speaking? Well, actually, first of all, what's the name of the country I live in? The country that I live in, however you pronounce it, uh, we call it Australia. Um, I live in Australia. It's just how we pronounce things in Australia. 
let's say I live in Australia, and the language that we speak, it ain't English, it's Australian. I'm from Australia and I speak Australian. And uh, one of my favorite examples of talking Australian is this word here. I don't know uh, if you know what this word is. It's something you use in your room if it gets really hot or if it gets really cold. When you use this particular thing, can you figure out what it is? I've got to say it a few times. If I say it, you'll figure it out straight away. But if you say it to yourself, you probably won't understand. And the answer is, it's an ignitioner. So if I get cold, I just turn on the ignitioner. And if I get hot, I'll just turn on the ignitioner. Uh, or maybe put on a jumper instead of a sweater. So uh, that's teaching you a bit of strain. And this is from a book called Let's Stalk Strain. Uh, it's a bit of an old book. Uh, Let's Stalk Strain. A nose tone unturned. Nose stone unturned. Nose stone unturned. Um, and um, so this book has lots of examples of talking strain and its author, I don't know if you can see here, uh, the author of this book, give me a zoom, uh, is this name here. And why Egnishna? It's Egnishna. That's what I'm saying. I, I turn on the air conditioner. Egnishna. Maybe you put a space in there, it's the Egnishna. Um, and the author of that book is this name. Uh, this person's also made a lot of dictionaries because his name is uh, Alphabet Lauder. So uh, you say alphabetical order, I say Alphabet Lauder. And so that's also a, a play on Torkenstrein. Alphabet Lauder. Okay, let's finish that response to some. Where was I writing an answer here somewhere? It is time zones. Fantastic. Another handy bit of code. Co developed with my viewers. That was lots of fun. Straya and Strine. Yep. Australia, Australian air conditioner, alphabet order. Um, uh, you know, if somebody says, what time is it? Um, what time is it? Oh, it's about half two. So we, we drop a lot of our, uh, our consonants and vowels and things in there. So that has been two hours. So thank you for viewing and watching me as I do <laughs> Strain and programming and occasionally a bit of AWS and Stack Overflow in there as well. Uh, feel free to join me uh, next week. It's Thursday today. Yeah, it's been Thursday for me for quite a while. So uh, join me again uh, in one week minus two hours and we'll have some more fun doing AWS Stack Overflow. I'll teach you a bit more strain maybe and uh, a bit of coding. So uh, cheerio, mate. G'day. See you next time. Beauty copper. <laughs> Catch you all later. Bye now.